You're listening to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. Visit our website for free resources to aid you in your pursuit of self-liberation, old Vanu publications, podcasts, guest articles, and much more. Go to VanuPodcast.com. And now, your hosts, Shane and Jason. And welcome to the Vani Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to coercion. I'm your host, Shane. This podcast is covered by a BIPCOT's No Government License, which allows reuse and modification to anyone, except for governments and the bludgies thereof. So please uh, yeah, please make sure to uh, stick around to the end of the show for our Building the Agora segments. Uh, there's some great podcasts and business- businesses on there uh, that you'll want to check out. So uh, anyway, I'm not sure what number of the podcast this episode will be, uh, but I'm pretty confident it will work its way into our uh, series on temporary autonomous zones. Uh, today I'm joined by John Vibes, author of Paper Squares and Purple Stars, My Life as a Rave Outlaw. Um, also, uh, Alchemy of the Timeless Renaissance, and a few books that he co-authored uh, with Derek Rose, all of which uh, I would highly, highly recommend. Uh, but the focus of the discussion today will be the first, uh, Paper Squares and Purple Stars. Uh, so yeah, back when we were talking, uh, first talking about Taz's on Liberty Attack Radio, I remember Kyle bringing bring up underground raves. Uh, you know, I, I thought, sure, you know, that, that's, that's an example, but I, I really didn't understand how underground and black markets, uh, you know, these things really were. Uh, that is until uh, I read John's book and, you know, got uh, a chance to, to examine it. Uh, um, yeah, so, so yeah, I started it one morning and uh, didn't put it down until I finished it later that day. Uh, it's an, incre- an incredible story, but even more so, uh, I was impressed by the security culture practiced. Uh, there's a lot that can be taken from the underground rave lifestyle uh, and applied to Taz's more generally. So that's exactly uh, what we're going to discuss today. But before I bring in my guest, uh, let me provide a brief, de- brief definition of temporary autonomous zones um, for those who may not be familiar with the term. So what Taz is a liberated area of land, time, and imagination, where one can be for something, not just against it, and where new ways of being human together can be explored and experimented with. Locating itself in the cracks and fault lines in the global grid of control and alienation, a Taz is an eruption of free culture, where life is experienced at maximum intensity. Uh, so some examples of this would be underground raves, freedom festivals like the Midwest Peace and Liberty Fest, uh, and Jackalope uh, as well. I just ha- haven't been there yet, though. Um, and then uh, also Van Nomad meetups uh, like the Rubber Tramp Rendezvous in Quartzsite, Arizona. So, uh, John, with that out of the way, man, uh, welcome to the Vani Podcast, sir. Uh, how are you doing today? Great, man. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to approach these topics uh, in this way. I don't think I've ever gotten to do that before, so I appreciate that. Hey, right on, right on. So um, I guess uh, for those who haven't read your books or, uh, or, or uh, heard you uh, in the alternative media, uh, why don't you start by uh, providing a brief introduction. Uh, who are you and uh, what do you do? Well, at this point, I'm basically a journalist and an author, uh, but I started out, as you read in my book, as a rave promoter, um, kind of actually an accidental rave promoter. I fell into it through some really weird circumstances, you know, and that that experience as we're kind of talking of running temporary autonomous zones for a couple of years, I, it it turned me into an activist. You know, I mean, I always have been all my life. I was always getting in trouble for, you know, the screw authority type of activity, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. and I had always had an interest in anarchism, even when I didn't understand what it was, you know what I mean? I just, uh, uh, but it was a very, very uh, limited understanding, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Because now, of course, uh, your audience knows that there's so many nuanced, different perspectives on one philosophy and so many disagreements about it. But uh, yeah, so in the future, I kind of want to, this book has, even though it was a, a true story and stuff, I wrote it like a novel. So it it was so much fun, you know, to to write a story like that and to to just create the dialogue and I kind of feel like just creating worlds and stuff like that might be even more fun. So that's what I'm going to be doing for the future uh, or what I at least hope to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course I'm working on the game project that's coming along with the uh, book too. So I hope to focus on a lot more on that on the future too. Awesome, awesome, very good, very good. And uh, why don't you uh, um, tell the listeners a little about uh, also the uh, the other books you've written, um, uh, like with uh, Derek Bros, then also um, yeah, the uh, uh, Alchemy of the Timeless Renaissance. Tell us about your uh, other books. 
So, uh, yeah, Alchemy of the Timeless Renaissance is actually the book that I talked about in the Paper Squares and Purple Stars book. So, like, my character is going through all this shit. Um, am I allowed to do, oh, yeah. do that? Yeah, you're, <laughs> Are we yeah, good you're on good. that? Yeah, you're good. Yeah, uh, no worries. <laughs> yeah, all right, cool. Um, yeah, so my, my character is going through all, all this stuff, throwing raves and everything, and... Um, as I said, I, I got into activism and I hadn't these experiences that were telling me that I, I needed to write this book. And that book ended up being Alchemy of the Timeless Renaissance. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like a conspiracy 101 kind of thing. You know, I was like 23 or something when I started writing it. Um, looking back on it now, I think most of it stands the test of time, but some of it you know, it's it's definitely not my best work, you know, uh, and, and I'm doing like a second edition to it uh, because I think that some things need to be updated. There are some things, there are some people that I quoted that no longer deserve to be quoted mm -hmm. um, <laughs> because of the things that have happened in the past couple of years, if you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And th there are just a couple of things like that. But overall, I think it's a really, really good book. And, and it, my thing was, I tried to take like all these arguments I was getting into with people like, you know, uh, the, about the food or, or you know, a any any kind of thing that I couldn't hit them back in the moment, you know, that I would go home and I would like go home, and make a note and I would research all this stuff and I would write what I should have said to that person in that argument in an essay, you know. And I just put them essays together, and that's what ended up being that first book. Oh, nice! And when, yeah, so so when I um when I started promoting for that book, I, I got, you know, I figured maybe I'll start doing this blogging thing, and then that ended up taking on kind of a life of its own, and I ended up having uh, years of relationships with these different websites that I write with and stuff, and. None of that I really ever expected when I wrote that book. It was just like, you know, I, I was literally blogging to promote for the book. And then, you know, that wasn't the what the universe had planned for me. You know, the right. universe had planned for me to do the journalism thing for a couple of years. And through that, I met Derek and um, we really resonated with each other because we were both really into the spirituality thing and into the anarchism. And usually um, the anarchist crowd, they stick their nose up at the spirituality. A lot of them are the ultra rational types. Um, right. They don't want to hear no woo woo or anything. You know what I mean? And I am perfectly cool with like making fun of myself and my own mystic beliefs. Like I can have fun with that. You know what I mean? I, I don't have to be like uh, one of these dogmatic people, but I definitely have that side of me. And so does Derek. So um, we joined together on that conscious resistance project and that ended up becoming three books, uh, which, you know, we're all really proud of and, you know, I, I hope that uh, we, we have them for free out on our website, you know what I mean? So, like, that's even, it's one of those things we just right. want to kind of get the, the message out there. And we feel that each part of it was kind of important because, like, the, the, first, the first book was, like, this bridge of spirituality and anarchism, which we thought was important. The second book was this kind of self-help book for, anar for for activists of any kind and people who are just spending all day like looking at shitty news trying to fight against the system and stuff <laughs> like you know just some things to kind of pick them up and, and, and make them realize that like you know th they are in a good and difficult fight and stuff and that there are some things that can kind of get them through the days and then the third um, the third book was where we tried to flesh out agorism a little bit more um, and explore some ideas of what would happen if people of different economic views were to clash in a free society or or how clashes could be avoided uh, between people of different economic systems who mm -hmm. might live on the borders of one another. Um, so we explored some stuff like that just in some basic thought experiments, not in anything like we're trying to lay down some law or principle or anything like that. We're just trying to explore some ideas and hopefully other people out there can, you know, build on that and, you know, maybe throw some stuff back at us and, and have some questions or, uh, you know, even, uh, 
point out some flaws. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And I will say, um, I, I didn't read the first one. Um, I've read the, I've read the, uh, the last two, uh, and I really enjoyed manifest of the free humans because that's, oh, that's, uh, I'm, I'm all about solutions. So when you guys were you're going through it, yeah, I, 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 I dug, uh, I definitely dug the, uh, um, the last book a, a lot. So, um, great work there. Great work there. Thanks man. Yeah. That actually was written when I was like really, really sick. Uh, I, I was in the middle of my cancer treatment and everything. I wasn't even sure if I was still fighting with the doctors because I eventually like gave in to the doctors because I was almost dead and I ended up, um, <laughs> you know, getting the, the poison and all that, um, <laughs> which actually did end up saving me because it just like had to be nuked at that point. Mm -hmm. Um, but anyway, uh, I, Derek came up, he flew down to my house in my cabin and like, I was just like laying down on my thing and we were like, uh, you know, we were dictating this stuff back and forth, you know? So it was, uh, it was pretty crazy, mm -hmm. but we, we sat there together for like a week and worked out the whole book. So it was, uh, it was, we were just locked up in my cabin for a week and, uh, yeah, that, that, that was, the brainstorming session that resulted in that book, but we really had a rough draft done by the end of that week. Awesome. Awesome. Very good. Very good. So, um, I guess, uh, um, we can go ahead and, uh, and get into, I guess the, the main topic of discussion here with paper squares, purple stars. And my, my first question was, um, an overview or introduction to, to the book, which you've, uh, which you've, uh, um, are already given, but uh, I guess, is there any, anything else introductory you want to, to mention about the book, uh, maybe in hopes of, uh, convincing my listeners uh, to buy it, which I highly recommend they do. Yeah, so it's it's really basically a behind the scenes look at what actually goes on at underground raves from the perspective of a person who hosted them but came like from the ground up and accidentally found their way into it. And not only was I hosting the parties, but I was also supplying them, you know, with things. Uh, you know, and that obviously made everything really crazy and but it also gave me a you know a look into all these different worlds and all these different sides of things and it it I definitely made for a really interesting story mm -hmm. but the other thing is is it's like a honest I think it's a, it's a more honest look at the black market than what you see in most uh, like film TV depictions and books and stuff like that because, you know, most of the time they have, like, kingpins and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. people who are, like, crazy, balling out of control, and they're super aggressive, and, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but that's not most people in the black market, you know? Most people are just, like, scared people who are trying to get by and... Um, you know, they're just average people. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, so, I've, I've watched, yeah. uh, I'm sure you've seen some of those, ne those documentaries on Netflix and they, they always, um, you know, it's TV. So they always like get these like big badass dudes who are apparently like the drug dealers and they're talking about how, you know, like, yeah, they're talking about how, you know, they, they love shooting people and all that. And it's like, I, you know, <clears throat> I'm sure there are those people out there, but um, <laughs> I doubt that's demonstrative of the entire, uh, you know, the, the entire, you know, black market. Yeah, exactly. And I I think that that's a very small percentage of the people that you would find. And of course, there is that and that exists. And I think I even touched on that a little bit, uh, you know, in my book, because there is a even even among hippies, there's like a negative side to it. You know what I mean? But it, it might not be, like, as bad as you would deal with, like, a cartel or something like that. But that exists, too. Mm -hmm. But the people who are getting locked up and thrown in cages on a general basis, you know, the vast, vast majority of them, like, 95% of the people are just your average friend, your, you know, anybody in your family, your brother, your cousin, like, and that's who the people is. Like, these are the people in our lives who are getting taken out of them and thrown in cages. And I could have been one of them. I, I was lucky to only spend a couple days in a holding cell a few different times. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but there are plenty of people who are not that lucky. Sure. Sure. 
Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's 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 definitely true. That's definitely true. So um, I guess uh, there was uh, there was one place that was that was very very important to your book, and and I went and watched. Um, I saw I saw it posted in one of your uh, comments on fascist book, um, the uh, news clip. But it was a very interesting place called God's Basement. I wasn't sure if it was real, so I I, I did actually go Google it whenever you, whenever you brought it up in the book, and yeah, you know it's real. Um, you know it's, it was a real place. So so tell us tell us a bit about it. Uh, what happened there? How long did it uh, function as a Taz? And I guess talk about how how it how it remained. Uh, you know, functioning for um, for you know that long. Yeah. Um, well, p it went through many different eras and many different uh, forms. Like it was kind of a weird spot that was in the rave scene for uh, at least a decade before I start I started getting involved there. But when I got involved there, there was this guy named Mickey who was running things, and I think he was the third person to be in control of it. And um, by then, it was already kind of like a, a, a sort of legendary place in Philadelphia. And it was essentially a, a rave that took place in the basement of this church in a pretty rough area of the city. And that's kind of how they got away with it, because the cops had too much going on. And they always did charity events and stuff like that, you know what I mean? And I'm pretty sure they gave the church quite a bit of money. Mm -hmm. And so, like, I know that the bishop was in there chilling, like, a couple times in slice. And even in that news clip that I told you about, the new, they, they're um, interviewing the bishop, and he's like, I didn't expect this from such an orderly group of people. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, so, like, from, from what I... And, and that place was not orderly. Like, there was all sorts of wild shit going down in there. So, you know, I, <laughs> I, I was involved in that place right at the tail end, uh, right before there was a news investigation. Like, the local NBC10 news, um, they went in there with their hidden cameras and stuff like that. And, you know, they publish some do you know where your kids are kind of thing <laughs> and it's definitely still up on youtube uh <laughs> oh yeah but it is. yeah that i i was there for that yeah and and they moved they moved the venue and it was like they tried to keep it alive after that but it was it was tough because once the heat was on that particular crew the company that ran it called true school the cops were just following them everywhere so all the venues that they dealt with wanted them to shake everybody down and it just wasn't the same anymore mm -hmm. um you know and then that is kind of that that is where i got my start because i was just like a helper there you know i was like i had become a trusted uh I guess helper really is the only word. I was like a street promoter and I just helped out around the shows, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, to, to that guy, Mickey, and that kind of springboarded me with a bunch of connections when everything hit the fan there. But yeah, I, I was really lucky to, it was like the last year that that place was open that I was there. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, so it sounds like, um, it, I guess it sounds like concealment is, is is one of the main reasons why they're able to keep it going. In that, like the and and may, if if the if I guess the the bishop was serious, um, like maybe maybe they just really had such a very like an above ground positive, you know, um, like maybe they're maybe they just uh, I guess were, um, <clears throat> I don't know, maybe they did. A, yeah, you said they kind of did charity work and such. So he was like, oh, they want to have the basement for you know like vacation Bible study or something. Like, yeah, they can have a little party like that there. Um, is that is that kind of uh, is that kind of the what, what you gather too that he was he just thought you know you guys are just nice kids and you wanted to have a place to do something do something you know biblical biblical. No, no, I think he knew what was going on there, but I think because there was no fights and that, like, he was making some money and that there was no nonsense, you know, because he could probably rent out I, – I, whole rental business, I'm sure, is pretty crazy because sometimes, all right, you get weddings and stuff like that or whatever, but if you're trying to rent out um, your hall for an event – Nine times out of ten, you're probably going to get, like, rowdy drunks in there and stuff like that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But if you have, like, a bunch of kids in there hugging each other and, and shit, like, then 
it's not really it's not a problem for the people who own it you know and and everything was kind of kept under control like everybody watched out for each other and and there was if somebody had any kind of medical issue it was taken care of which it wasn't often because you know most of the stuff was okay that was going around and and people were careful about what they were doing mm-hmm. uh but yeah concealment is a big thing and also paying off whoever is in control of the property is the big deal too and you know in a poverty stricken neighborhood uh those churches are poor and they need money you know what i mean um i remember they used to do really crazy punk rock shows at the churches around here and they would have like satanic punk bands playing at these churches and stuff they would have uh, so so it's it's pretty weird the the whole church rental thing (laughs) (laughs) right Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, certainly. Certainly. So, um, so like, uh, like when when God's basement got shut down, or when you when you were um, you know looking for pl- when you were looking for places to, to host these underground r- raves, um, how how were how were they selected? I mean, what are some of the attributes that had to be checked off checked off your list? Like, for example, if someone's going to be pursuing strategic relocation, they're going to look at uh, you know the weather. They're going to look at the population density. They're going to look at um, if they're, if they're going to be pursuing wilderness fauna or their national forest, where they can you know go go live out there. Um, you know, there's there's these character. You know, there's there's things that you look into. To. So what, what what are those for choosing places for underground raves? Yeah, the the neighborhood really is the most imp- – well, that's not the most important, but that's the first part that you really check off your list because, of course, like that's the geography. That's like the biggest thing to mark off. You know what I mean? Once you get that, you could start to narrow it down within that area. But there are certain towns and stuff that just have – police forces or they have residents that are just not acceptable like they 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 won't accept the culture it will be an issue if it's in the town like not in my backyard kind of thing so like you want to look out for those type of neighborhoods and avoid them or or even those type of cities like cities that have had issues with other parties in the past where they've kicked them out or something like that um like you could see that like certain parties are or certain places are bad for a while so like um electric zoo that thing that happened a couple years ago in new york it still happens but um it was like the really really big one year and there are people with a bunch of fake drugs and you know a couple kids got really hurt i think maybe one of them even died and there was like this mm. big media thing about it and then new york was like dead for a couple of years after that you know what i mean like nobody could do a party in new york for a couple of years after that and it goes in waves in different areas like that so that is definitely a problem uh but once you narrow it down from there and you're starting to look at individual places, um, the, a parking lot is definitely really important. Um, sometimes in big metropolitan cities, you could kind of get away with it. But, you know, a, a parking lot is definitely a big deal. And mm-hmm. you, the, and it also as secluded as possible. Like if you could get a place that's secluded, has a big parking lot, has um, enough room, has multiple rooms is is best, you know, for people to like have room to run around and stuff like that. Um, you know, and a lot of it comes down to the ownership too because that is always like the craziest var- variable because club owners can be crazy and they can be shysty. And uh, that is just a whole other kind of variable that you have to deal with. But generally, um, you know, uh, the parking lot is a really big deal and just the size of the space and what they have available. Um, It used to be like look for places that would allow smoking inside, even though I'm not a cigarette smoker. having a bunch of kids with glow sticks around their necks smoking outside of your building is like a big ass target you know what i mean (laughs) yeah no joke so um yeah so i i used to really look for places that would allow smoking inside but that's harder and harder to find right 
Right. Okay. Okay. Very interesting. So um, I, I guess we, we already talked about this a little bit with concealment, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious about other, I guess, general strategies too. Like uh, I know there was the, uh, um, the scene where uh, um, I, I guess the guy vandalized the uh, place behind uh, your apartment complex and someone saw him do it and the cops were there. Um, and you, you, you understood, uh, I don't know if you role played police interrogations before that, but you, you, you knew what you had to do, you know, walk out the door and close it behind you. I mean, you, you, you handled everything right. So that was, that was one, that was one way, uh, I guess one strategy uh, that she used um, to, you know, remain as invulnerable, in, invulnerable to those uh, coercers as possible. But um, tell us uh, more about some of the strategy, strategies and tactics that, uh, that you guys employed to uh, stay out of trouble. Well, I mean, well, in my case, with the venue that we were dealing with after, um, uh, after God's Basement, which I called Galaxy in the book, but the real name of it is actually the Black Hole. That was the name of the place. Okay. Um, the former owner of it who like went down, he's like a former lawyer and stuff. And like, I don't, you know, I don't know what the deal is with that. So I just like called it something else. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> that, uh, with that place, I mean, it was private property. We had our liquor license. We could not let cops in. So that was like one thing, you know? Um, but as far as the concealment, definitely not letting, uh, people out, uh, that that was one of the reasons why places did a lot of places did no no reentry, um, is not for any of the reasons why the mainstream clubs do it because they don't want people drinking in their cars or whatever. This is like we don't want people outside getting in trouble, right. and that's when it gets it gets really serious when you're doing like a warehouse party like I did at the place Ground Zero that I described. Um, I used to have to like be peeking my head out the door, be looking around in the parking lot. And, you know, you have to tell these people like, don't crack your glow sticks until you get inside the building and don't be running around looking like a hooligan until you get in the building. Some, some parties, like there was this one, it wasn't one that I did, but there, there's this uh, big forest called the Pine Barrens in uh, New Jersey. And it's mm -hmm. apparently where the mob buries their bodies and shit. <laughs> oh wow! Um, and I think there's, I think there's still some side trans parties that happen out there uh, by a crew called Guy in Mind. Unfortunately, I've never uh, been to any of them, but they used to have some renegade parties out there, and they would just set up in the national forest and stuff. And for them, those parties, they used to tell people um, wear church clothes on the way to the show. You know what I mean? And they used to tell people to have a story just in case they got pulled over of where they were going and what the deal was. So they don't say, hey, we're going to this party. It's right over here. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> right. obviously they're not supposed to be there. So those are like little dumb things that like you usually would not think about. And most people that go to throw a rave, they don't think about that stuff. And that's why a lot of stuff gets busted. Um you know, because it'll just, the cops come back there a lot of times, depending on the situation and depending on the location. In a situation like the Pine Barrens, if they pulled over some kid with dreadlocks and stuff and he, where are you going? And he said, we're going to this party. They would definitely show up there. Right, right. <clears throat> okay, interesting, interesting. Now, um, there there was uh, another character. Uh, there was a character in your book that I found interesting. Uh, she wasn't she wasn't in there for very long, but um, uh, it was uh, it was Amber. Um, she was uh, you know I was I was impressed by uh, you know by what I heard about her story. Um, so yeah, she she traded in, in you know the, in the ethical enclaves, as Ray would put it. She was she was an agorist. Um, she was uh, yeah selling things. <clears throat> but uh, anyway, from from the way it sounded in the book, uh, you would never have guessed that she would have been um, you know uh, you would have been someone that was moving that much weight you know um like she was kind of blended in just like she was a party person um so i mean she was she was practicing great security culture and she was able to achieve financially independent early retirements um very in her life uh, you know very early in her life through um you know these uh um you know sales at uh, at, at uh, you know temporary autonomous zones. So I, I thought that was interesting yeah definitely and actually that character is a composite character that is three people mashed together and it is three of the people that um supplied the black hole in a in a middle period um that that i was familiar with um and so i took all of the best character uh characteristics and coolest things that those people did and blended them into one character 
And um, that is definitely my favorite character in the book, for sure. <laughs> and uh, I, 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 I really like intended it to be that way. Um, and I, I just, I, I thought that she was a really cool character. Um, but yeah, and I do definitely have a friend that is just chilling, traveling the world right now, um, doing their thing, you know. And I hear from them every now and then. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty pretty interesting yeah yeah no I, I obviously wouldn't recommend like it wouldn't be like my first recommendation like i would you know like try try to find a side hustle like i mean i'd, I'd say that probably something you know maybe more sustainable unless you're looking to like get in get, get in and get out quick like if you can't you know uh you know intensively save for 10 or 15 years to you know um, retire early and you want to get it over with maybe maybe it's a possible route i guess to, to each their own um but uh, i i just really enjoyed and, and yeah like she was she was a, a pretty minor character in the book um as far as like you know how how, how long she was in their page was but um i mean i she she stuck out um yeah she, she definitely stuck out for me probably also because she was packing heat too right <laughs> yeah that too yeah yeah yep indeed indeed i i definitely <laughs> i was like i was like I, I i can't have all of the characters like i gotta have like some of the characters like strapped with guns and shit you know oh, what yeah. i mean <laughs> yeah of course of course <laughs> uh, Right on. Um, but, but, but yeah, I think I wouldn't recommend it either, dude. Like, I don't think that that is a, I, you know, it's the only option for some people, you know what I mean? And, and for other people, they get opportunities. Like I got an opportunity to walk into that club, walk into the dude's office, walk around selling the stuff and then walk out with money and not have to be in a dangerous area with anything. You know what I mean? Right. So that was like an opportunity opportunity that I took but there are some people who grow up in poverty and they don't have any chance any choice but to sell whatever people are doing out on the street so uh, I, that's why I think it was important like I definitely um, I celebrate the drug culture and the hustler culture and stuff like that mm -hmm. uh, because I think that those people deserve to be celebrated but oh, yeah. not because I think that anybody but not because I think that anybody should get into that lifestyle. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. And, and the way that the way it is yeah. risky as hell. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that's why, like, uh, <clears throat> you know, um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're taking on so much risk to provide a market demand. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's there's so much risk, like just 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 starting a business in and of itself is filled with risk. It's not, you know, most most, you know. Uh, you know, most entrepreneurial ventures fail, but then you you look at um, like uh, you look at the amount of risk, uh, the the additional risk um, with something in the black market. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, exactly. I, I I think, and I that's kind of how I I set it up in my book, really, because I mean, in the in the end, I got I. I got out of it because I got into activism and I knew that like you could you can't be an agorist and like a, a full that kind of agorist and an activist at the same time like you need to like pick one or the other you know if depending on how much of a target you are you know right like uh don't give them an easy know. reason <laughs> yeah don't give them an easy reason yeah yeah exactly like I mean I I think that I I would still consider myself an agorist but I think that it's it's not like uh, well we 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 actually covered this in the in the book with the vertical and horizontal agorism and the uh uh introverted and extroverted agorism where it's mm -hmm. like uh there are some things where it's like you're definitely actively working against the system but you're taking a little bit less risk and a little bit more risk and um you got to ha have a good balance depending on what you're doing because if you're putting yourself out on the spotlight and making your t yourself a target like you know your car's getting pulled over when you're going down the road so mm -hmm. like you got to be careful about what you you have on you and your job better not be having 100 e pills on you you know what i mean because then you're screwed right yeah yeah so that's kind of why i uh got got out of the game and as i explain in the book is like there's just so much pressure and stress for a person who is sensitive to that kind of stuff yeah 
Yeah, definitely. And I guess right, right alongside that, there was, there was something else that, uh, that, I, that I just recalled from your book. Um, and uh, you, you mentioned um, that there were actually times of the day and yeah, there, were, there were times of the day and also what, like weather scenarios um, that, sh that are better for traveling, you know, with stuff in your vehicle, um, which I, I thought was interesting because we've talked about yeah, role-playing police interrogations and driving an inconspicuous car. Um, but I'm, uh, it, yeah, uh, could, could you speak to that? Um, you know, are there, any, are there better times that, that you found? Oh, yeah, definitely. So um, when the bars are getting out is the absolute worst time. So like any time between one and four, probably, you have a heightened police situation. After four o'clock, you have people who are going to work and stuff like that. You really don't have a lot to worry about. When it's raining, those cops don't like to get wet. When it's snowing, they're dealing with accidents and I just make damn sure you don't get in an accident um <laughs> the thing is is like I like variables I can control and that is one that you can control pretty well you know I mean of course there's other you know things that can come into the uh, equation but you, you you can control a lot less when a cop is pulling you over than oh, yeah. w when you can driving on a snowy road <laughs> so yeah, so that is definitely uh, important, and um, even back roads, too. Like, we, we used to hit all sorts of back roads, and I think that that was something that I explained, uh, too, in the book. And even that ended up kind of messing me up one time because I was taking a back road, and it was raining, and I slipped up. But that was also because I was driving under the influence, which I shouldn't have been doing. <laughs> <laughs> Right, right. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm curious because I, I know with, uh, like, if you look at uh, um, Hakeem Bey's book or kind of just uh, about just Taz's generally, um, there's a lot of talk about uh, a lot of talk about culture. And you talk about that a lot in your book, too. And not just one culture, but there it seems like there are two, two separate and distinct rave cultures. The underground one that, that you were more in favor of, um, you know, the peace, love, unity, respect. And then there was kind of that above ground kind of mainstream uh, mainstream rave scene. So could you could you tell us a bit about, um, I guess, uh, the culture, um, the cultures that you experienced uh, um, throughout, uh, you know, the book and your journey? Yeah, yeah, that's definitely a very interesting kind of concept because there is like kind of an overarching rave culture um but unfortunately the overarching rave culture that everybody that goes to that stuff fits under is all really superficial so you know it's the music the lights and that stuff is all the same uh, wherever you go and you know uh, people different cities like different styles more than others or whatever but it's generally all the same um, but the cultures and the and the beliefs are are entirely different um, there is the uh, their original rave culture I feel like it was more cohesive you know in the late 80s very early 90s when everything was kind of just beginning it was a very like peace love vibe it was just just how the underground thing is now of course that went through a phase where things went downhill and and all, all movements have that but there there is like a corporate culture that comes in and not that i have a problem with you know business or anything like that but when you have the mass of society who aren't like who aren't into something to be a part of the culture you know they're they're just going somewhere on a weekend to get messed up or whatever um or to hear something that they heard on the radio right they're not going to really bring a whole lot of good energy to the table you know the people who are feel like they're a part of a family and they know each other and they saw each other last week and like you know they helped each other through a bad trip last year that's kind of how it used to be that's how it was at god's basement that's how it was at the black hole that's how it was at the events way back in the day and there is still underground stuff like that now but it's and I saw uh, Jeremy ask the question earlier, uh, is it harder or easier to do the kind of underground stuff? And that answer that kind of fits in mm -hmm. here. Um, back then, 
it was easy to find places that would do it. It was hard to get away with it once the cops found you. So you could pop off a place for, you know, six months, a year, and then the cops find you and then you're done. You got to move, maybe even change your company name for a little bit. <laughs> um, but, you know, now the cops, they're kind of lightening up to it, oddly enough. Because really? they're they're all, fr yeah, yeah, because weed's legal now, so they can't just poke their head in a club and be like, I smell weed, let's raid the place. Um, and heroin is what everybody is freaking out about. So a couple of people doing psychedelics in, you know, a room and, you know, all this Silicon Valley stuff about psychedelics and it is, it's not as hardcore as it used to be. I mean, they got, I saw pictures from Electric Forest where cops are, you know, got bead bracelets up to their uh, elbows and stuff. And I read stories that they didn't even arrest nobody there. Um, so I think that that dynamic is changing, but the problem is, is it's harder to find places that will host that kind of underground stuff. And usually places that are suited for that, they're just trying to sell their space to somebody who's going to host a big EDM concert in there, you know, like a big, uh, big headline DJ and everybody's just going to come into their one room and they're going to have their big security at the door and everything is going to be by the book. Um, you know, a lot of venues are nervous about taking on the responsibility these days. So that is the hard part. Sure. Okay. Yeah, that, that, that definitely makes sense. That definitely makes sense. So, so right along, right along with culture, and uh, it, I brought this up uh, in the definition earlier, earlier on in this episode. But um, so a, a definition of a TAS, or I guess one like just one sentence of, of the full definition is uh, a TAS is an eruption of free culture where life is experienced at maximum intensity. Uh, does does that sentence describe your experience uh, in, in the underground rave scene? Yeah, I think that's a perfect. Uh, just, I think it fits the description perfectly. Good deal. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I that's yeah that's that's kind of what I what I gleaned from from your book. But uh, um, yeah, that's uh, I mean uh, the the Taz's I've really been to um, are like I guess the more formal ones. I guess um, like the Midwest Peace Liberty Fest. I mean I I always tout um, you know like the I, I I love the atmosphere there the the, the culture. It's just a really really great festival. So um, I figured it was uh, similar in some ways and and uh, different in, in others. Well, yeah, I mean, that's that's what I was always trying to create, and that's, like, why I stuck with it for so long, and that's why I got, you know, that that became everything about my life, and I became so militant in that is because I was, like, creating this atmosphere for freedom that I was hoping was going to get bigger, I was going to be able to do more, and it was, like, that was the mentality that I had. I was trying to create change uh with those events and not just that just give people a reprieve you know give people a place where they could go to get the hell away from all mm -hmm. the craziness um and and go into a different kind of craziness that's actually enjoyable um but but yeah that that was what really really motivated me and i feel like that was kind of what made me unique in a way but that really did not help me. I, I think that hurt me, actually. <laughs> um, you know, be, because, you know, like I was trying to, I was trying to educate to people too much. I was ignoring the music way too much. I really didn't even care about it. <laughs> um, you know, like, so, so there were some certain like mistakes I, I made there by being like overly militant about that stuff. But I don't know if I regret it. You know what I mean? Like, cause it's like, that was my path. Like I'm, I, I quit doing those shows for years because, um, things just hit a dead end. I mean, uh, uh, spoiler alert, but as I say in my book, like, uh, I kind of got overtaken by, uh, people who were able to book bigger DJs, bigger venues and stuff like that. And I think that I may have turned quite a few people away with my crazy online stuff, <laughs> but like, I don't care, you know? Um, and I'm here, I am doing stuff again. And, 
I, you know, I did my first party back as a release party at a warehouse in Baltimore last month. It, you know, it did all right. We just about broke even if you count the books that I sold to. Um, but it's, it's one of those things where now I'm just probably going to, uh, post my craziness on my personal page and leave the business page for the musical stuff. You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I've, <laughs> I, I can certainly understand that. I've, I've thought about that too. You know, the opportunities I've, I might have missed from, um, you know, uh, some of my, uh, my more radical beliefs just being, you know, publicly out there. But at the same time, I, I don't really care that much because I don't, I don't want, to, I don't want to be accepted into, into that society anyway, right? Um, I don't really care. Um, I, yeah, I don't really care too much. Uh, you know what? Uh, you know what they think of me, right? Um, so that's that's kind of kind of how I've how I've looked at it myself, but. Uh, yeah, exactly. It's just like I, I know that there were definitely I was a very difficult person. Uh, I, I, I mean, I still am in those regards, but like there were certain larger companies that probably would have hired me to, to, to go on to do certain things. But I was just way too difficult in, in those regards. And there is no way that I was going to you know, just bend on certain things. And, you know, I'm just going to keep on saying this stuff. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, never, uh, you never apologize for, for your principles. Um, definitely not. Um, so, so I guess, um, one, one interesting question that goes along with, and I guess this more, this would be more related to kind of second realms where there's, um, you know, more of kind of a semi-permanent thing, more of a, more of a longer term, which I guess, uh, I guess in, in, in some uh, underground raves could, could be as well. Um, but, uh, there's, uh, um, in second realm book on strategy, smuggler and XYZ talk, uh, quite a bit about, uh, you know, conflict resolution. Um, so I'm, I'm curious, um, <clears throat> You know, there there are always going to be disagree. There are always going to be disagreements when you bring human beings together, and there will always be violators of personal property. Um, it's just uh, you know that's the world we live in. So, I guess um, how how did you guys handle um, you know some of those uh, internal conflicts and kind of uh, um, those those uh, those disputes? Um, you know, in, in that sort of a culture, that sort of environment. Well, we never ever really called the police, except for snitches who you know suck, but. You know, is generally like you don't use the police to solve problems. There are grimy ass people who get into beefs with people or something like that, and they they will go call the cops and they'll you know start some shit like that. And that was actually one of the big problems with the club that I was involved with. There were quite a few former employees who turned on the place and became witnesses. Um, so like that is definitely a problem and that is how we try to not resolve conflicts but there was you know there are certain things like there there are certain things that are that are once certain lines are crossed on things then a certain person could be blacklisted like if a dude is crosses a line with with a chick in a, in a really messed up way then usually they're going to be blacklisted from a region and not allowed uh to go into the shows there just for the safety of the other women there mm -hmm. um and but you know fights are so rare um because even when people really hate each other in this environment, like it's so rare for things to come to blows. Um, you know, hippies don't really get in fights a whole lot. They do steal from each other, though. That's that's definitely a problem. Um, and that is dealt with a whole variety of ways, man. And like things can get pretty gangster, surprisingly, with hippies. They could steal shit back from one another, break into each other's places. Like, it could get kind of red market sometimes, you know what I'm saying? Um, and, yeah, but, but yeah, like, that, that kind of stuff could happen. But when that does happen, especially, like, at parties, if you see it happen, if you know about it happening, um, in our communities, a lot of times we dealt with it. Like, we just would talk to the person and, and, you know, sit down with them and, and be like, what's going on? Uh, and 
a lot of times that would really help, you know? I mean, sometimes, like, people need help. A lot of times, the most messed up kid at a party that needs to be dealt with by quote-unquote security, which at an underground party is just a raver who is just as fucked up as everybody else in a security t-shirt. Um, but yeah, the the, ki- the kids that get into those positions or they're at the, the messed up trip tent, those people usually just really, really need help in their lives. And of course, that environment is a magnet for people who really need help in their lives, unfortunately. Sure. Uh, and and actually, fortunately, because it's an opportunity for to to you know kind of interact with a lot of them people. But there are definitely like a lot of lost souls in that environment, and just like talking to them and being empathetic with them is a really huge deal. And the other thing is is accountability, because in those communities, everybody knows everybody. So, like, do you want to be the person that everybody's gossiping about? Because they do that. They do a lot of that shit. So um, I think that that is a big part of the social cohesion there is that, um, you know, it's a very tight knit community where a lot of people you know, everybody knows who you are kind of when you go to a lot of these parties in the same area and you see the same faces as the regulars, all the regulars always know each other. Like not everybody, but the regulars definitely do. Mm -hmm. So I really think that that actually keeps people in check, uh, surprisingly amount. Right. Right. So more just, uh, I guess, social enforcement. Um, Let's see. Yeah, it's social enforcement. It seems like okay. Interesting. Interesting. So I, I guess um, kind of along, along along the same lines here, uh, at least uh, in a way. Um, so it seems like uh, um, from rem- remembering back to your book. Um, so God's basement was uh, was definitely more, I guess, decentralized. There were different people that uh, you know, I guess, kind of uh, handled it. Um, there, it was kind of a group of people that that handled things. Um, it seemed like uh, at uh, at Galaxy. Um, or I guess uh, um, the black hole. Um, uh, the the guy owned it, and he kind of made the decisions. Um, at least at least uh, you know in large parts. So um, my uh, my buddy Hinza asks: Is there a way to decentralize responsibility of a physical TAS, uh, as in no individuals in charge? Uh, so w- what do you think, John, uh, from from your experience? Well, I think that it's definitely possible. But the the first thing is like uh, there has to be like anonymity of everybody involved. Um, so for example, after God's basement closed, there was this party called war dance, uh, which I described in the book, which one thing that I really didn't describe in the book that was actually kind of funny is it was like 10 years ago and there was a bunch of like suburban white kids running around in headdresses and shit. Cause it was like native American themed <laughs> and, um, nobody really thought anything of it at the time, <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, that party was like right after um, God's Basement got shut down, and it was thrown by s- nobody knew who did it. Nobody knew who did that party, and e- I personally think it was the same people behind God's Basement. That was my thinking, but nobody knew who it was, and it was very hard to have a target because even with God's Basement, there there were a couple people involved, but that guy Mickey was like pretty much in charge and he was the guy who ended up on the news when everything went down so yeah i think having anonymity of everybody involved and having a lot of people involved the other problem is ownership though like because there's going to be an owner of the property you know what i mean but this is this is why outlaws happen which they are renegade parties um which are you you break into a property. Um, and now in some cases this could be considered homesteading <laughs> because, a, you know, va- vast majority of these, uh, properties are super, super abandoned. Like the renegade party that I described in the book where I said that the, um, if the, MC announced that if people walk too far towards the back of the room, they might fall through the floor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it looked like it was a war zone. They said if you have to take a piss, you go back in the corner. Um, (laughs) You know, it it was, and it really did look like it was a building in 
Palestine or something like that, you know, or in, in some kind of war zone. Uh, there was rubble everywhere, but they, they, they broke into some steel door and the place probably hadn't been, you know, nobody probably been in there for 20 years or something like that. It seemed like, mm-hmm. um, and, but then you set up there, you set up with some cheap equipment and then when the cops show up, nobody knows what the fuck, you know, the worst they can do is confisc- confiscate the equipment. Um, but that is really, truly the only way to decentralize it is to do the renegade style and not have it on property that you own. Um, now, you don't have to physically break into a property and possibly, you know, commit a nap violation if you want to go do it in a public park like the people did in the Pine Barrens. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's always a possibility, too. But the owner of the property is always going to take a lot of the heat. Uh, so that, you know, that's the uh, anonymity of everybody involved and having it on property that you don't own <laughs> is, right. is the key to the decentralization, I think. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. So I, I don't have, uh, I don't have much, I don't have anything else in my outline, but uh, I guess just a general question kind of, uh, um, just uh, to, to get as much valuable information out of this as possible. Um, I guess any other tips or advice on uh, on setting up Taz's, maintaining Taz's um, from from your experiences in uh, in the rave scene? Uh, well, I mean, I think that picking the per that picking the place, the best place in the first place, is a huge deal because. If you pick the wrong place, then no matter what you do, like you're screwed, you know. And I think that there are some people who try to keep certain places alive uh, uh, for certain things, or you know, they have the sunk cost fallacy. You know what I mean? Where they think, oh, well, we've been doing this in this city forever, and and we just need to keep on doing this here. Mm-hmm. And it's like, well. Everybody's already got your number. It don't work like that. So um, I think that that is definitely important. Um, I think owning, eventually taking, you know, full ownership of your own area is definitely important because you don't want to be at the whim of, you know, a club owner or a property owner or, you know, uh, you you don't want to be somebody's... uh, employee or or tenant necessarily in that sense Mm -hmm. um because they can screw everything up you know as as i've definitely seen many many times uh so i i think that's definitely an important variable and in in this you know of course the police but depending on what kind of situation you're dealing with the police um can be dealt with in a variety of ways and how I would deal with the police 10 years ago is probably way different than I deal with them today. You know, before it was just like hide everything, hide everything. And it, to, to, it's still like that to some extent, but now like you kind of be a little bit more straight with venues and cops, you know, um, and be like, Hey, I, I don't know exactly, uh, what's, go we're not selling drugs in here but uh a kid or two might be on them might have taken them before they got here you know what i mean like and the, i think that's like the kind of thing that like they're cool with here and now it, it just used to be so much different it and it's crazy that we've come so far in this just such short amount of time but a lot of it has to do with the weed thing i think even though um you know psychedelics are kind of like, kind of following i just you know, back then, all drugs were the same to everybody. And I feel like now, even the dumbasses out in general society are starting to see the nuance of the situation and starting to see that, like, oh, like, everybody's dying of freaking smack. You know what I'm saying? Like, we need to, like, and and, and weed is, is helping people. So it's it's just not... Right, and, and a lot, uh, a lot of this shit's a not, not even close to as bad as what, you know, they were told in government schools. And they're, they're you know, people are finally realizing, huh, maybe, maybe we haven't really been told the whole truth about all these things. Yeah, you think? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So now I think that, like, people who are from that kind of culture are not really frowned upon as much. But I think that 
somebody who's looking to set up like uh, an anarchist community or something like that, I feel like they're going to face more heat in these kind of days because there's so much hysteria around guns and groups that like to have them and groups that have political opinions and especially when they form together, you know what I mean? So that is something that's going to, I think, be <laughs> probably the biggest challenge for people who are trying to do that, you know, aside from getting everybody to get along, which is always the biggest challenge. Yeah, or, or you know, there, um, you know, this the location has to be chosen for this thing, right? And getting people to actually uproot their entire lives, or you know, up, yeah, uproot their lives to to go to go somewhere else is, is always difficult. I mean, that's that's been the major project problem with uh, kind of these new libertarian country projects that that happened throughout the twentieth century. Is all right, we've uh, you know, we've got we've got we've got all we've got the we've got some money, we've got some land. Who wants to come out here? Crickets. I'm like, okay, well, I guess. It's a problem. <laughs> That's a problem. But uh, I guess uh, I guess uh, another another possibility, and this is uh, I interviewed Smuggler, the author of a uh, second round book on strategy, and he's doing they're doing something uh, pretty interesting. I'm, I think over uh, in Europe somewhere. Uh, but they have uh, kind of a more of a it's like a more of a permanent, um, semi permanent, I guess you could say, um, TAS, and uh, they have leased land in a commercial you know in a commercial zone, and um, and it's a place that stores shipping containers. Um, so one of the things when, when they were, when they were coming up with this idea is, well, you've got to have highly mobile capital because if, uh, you know, if, if, uh, it's, it's found out and you got a, you know, an impending raid or something, you don't want to lose all that capital. That'd be really disheartening to have to restart every single time. So they thought, well, if we, uh, you know, rent, you know, rent commercial, you know, rent commercial land in a place that stores shipping containers and, you know, people live in, sh in shipping containers nowadays, um, you know, the shipping container homes. Um, so they have, you know, a TAS and shipping containers just sitting in, uh, you know, some commercial Commercial lots. They've got electricity out there. People stay there, um, and um, the landlord doesn't know what's doesn't know what's going on because, well, they're good tenants. They pay their bills. Why why the hell would he you know go out there and check on their storage containers? You know, um, so I guess that's uh, that's another potential route. Yeah, that's really awesome. I had never heard about that before. Yeah, yeah, there, yeah. It's uh, some, yeah, some some interest. Definitely some interesting stuff. And uh, you know, it's 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 kind of the cypherpunk type people that are uh, that are doing a lot uh, that are. Pushing for it, and there's not a lot of them, but um, the 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 select ones I know of, yeah, they're all cypherpunks. So, um, yeah, there, there's a lot of cool stuff going on, man. A lot of cool stuff. So, um, I guess uh, people want to uh, to follow you, uh, buy your books, uh, etc. Where where can they uh, do that? So on uh, the the website for the book is raveoutlaw.com, and the uh, my most active social media is facebook.com slash JG Vibes, and then I have Twitter at John G Vibes. Okay, very good, and I will get to all of those uh, all of those in the show notes. Um, well, yeah, man, I, I definitely appreciate you coming on and uh, kind of uh, sharing your knowledge and your experiences because uh, um, obviously, uh, thinking about these things theoretically is important. Um, but uh, you know, even even though um, some of the tasks may not uh, you know follow the same model as an underground rave, uh, there's certainly out of uh, a, a lot of parallels and a, a lot of uh, valuable input. So uh, I definitely appreciate you coming on and, uh, and telling us about it. Yeah, definitely. It was really awesome to explore the concept in that way. And I think I really hope that, uh, you know, some people even like, you know, that, that go to parties and have never thought about them this way can kind of like uh, open their minds to some things after listening to this. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I definitely hope so. So, uh, yeah, thanks a lot, man. And uh, I, I really appreciate it. Awesome, man. All right. Um, all right. And there you have it. Uh, John Vibes, author of Paper Squares and Purple Stars and uh, and uh, I guess a few a few other books. I uh, definitely go check those out. I uh, definitely purchase them. I, I guarantee and I, I keep seeing the feedback that people can't put down Paper Squares and Purple Stars. So you definitely want to pick up a copy of that. Uh, so, yeah, big thanks to John for coming on and thank you for tuning in. Until next time, let's build the, let's build the Agora and let's build Second Realms.